God bless you. Thank you very much, brother. God bless you. My son, Timothy. <laughs> That's very funny. God bless you. You don't know how that makes me feel to see a young man hear them words spoken like that. It means, brother, that my work wasn't all in vain. I'm getting up into the years, and he's the one who's following along. And I, it just makes me feel so good to hear that a meeting like that, what it produced. You never know what you're doing when you're sowing seeds. There's a legend over in Norway that they have a lot of beautiful flowers in Norway. And the legend is, like John Apple here, you know, that this man loved flowers so well, he carried his pockets full of seeds. and. He went around just sowing seeds everywhere he'd see plate. He sowed seeds of flowers, and that's the reason there's so many flowers, because someone sowed seeds. That's it. Let's sow the seed of the Word of God wherever we are, for we don't know what it's going to produce. And them few seeds that night fell in fertile soil that brings forth a, a real, genuine servant of God, standing here as a shining light. I passed by his church the day, and I don't remember the boy, of course, but to me, just a kid, I doubt being as old as my Billy. But he's um, standing down there and seeing this nice big assembly of God Church built down there. I stopped this moment. I said, thank you, Father. Keep your hand on him. And partings leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Certainly a happy, real happy anniversary. God's blessings on you all. Now, tomorrow's Sunday, and we are expecting all you visitors to attend somebody's church tomorrow. These men here on the platform are men who are local ministers, and they are here representing this gospel that you're hearing us preach. They believe the same thing that we believe in sitting here representing it. And fill up your churches tomorrow. Have a great time. And... Then tomorrow afternoon we're giving the afternoon service in the, instead of having evening service because it just pulls the people away from their own post of duty and we can have it in the afternoon. We ought to worship all day Sunday. That's what they set aside for that. So now go to Sunday school in the morning somewhere and stay for church. And it's always a sin to send your children to Sunday school. You know that. Everyone knows that. A sin to send your children to Sunday school. Take them. <laughs> That's it. So then you're doing right, but doing wrong, but just sending them. And then tomorrow afternoon at 2.30, be here on time if you can, and we're going to anticipate another healing service for tomorrow afternoon. I pray the Lord will give us exceedingly abundantly uh, tomorrow afternoon. It's been such a real service. Uh, if those, if that cook or chef that cooked that breakfast this morning, uh, over here in the, I don't know what we call the place, on the grounds here, say that was really good. Frankly, that's the first good solid meal I've eaten this week, and it, that cookies or the bread, ever what it was, sweet bread, that was good. Ever, I, I really like that. I like to have that recipe. And Sister Woods, you take it home to me and. <laughs> See if she could try <laughs> to cook it. That's good Methodist cooking. That's really, <laughs> it's really good. We appreciate it. And uh, if the dean would happen to be present, we're sorry that we stayed over time not knowing it. Of course, I uh, understand, uh, Brother Sir, that uh, maybe uh, your services, uh, you all have your services just so much time lotted, you're automatically used to that. But I tell you, brother, these Pentecostal people it really has a gastronomical jubilee when they get around. And they just stay all day. You just have to run them out. That's all there is to it. Just get them, get them off your hands. So, they, um, But we tried to dismiss Billy Motion 15 minutes. I think we had it cleared before 15 minutes for you. And we're sorry that we uh, interrupted there because we didn't know it. And we certainly thank you from the depths of our heart for letting us have that breakfast, and you fine ladies that served, and whatever more. Thank you very kindly. God's rich blessings be with you. Now, I was thinking of, can't get it off my mind, that this 
Brother Hill's uh, conversion. Uh, Brother Banks Woods, one of my associates, is sitting here tonight somewhere. I suppose he didn't go home today, but he was in the meeting this morning. That's where his boy, right, the meeting just before that, it, uh, was healed. Every time he mentioned a meeting, I something uh, outstanding. Now, I just like, I don't want to get away from a text here, but I just like to tell a little instance that happened that really cut the warts off of me at that meeting, the same one you was converted in. I tell you how easy it is to just walk away from the kingdom of God if you don't. My old mammy used to tell me, she said, honey, you always think twice and then speak once. That's very, very good uh, philosophy. <laughs> it uh, really is. I was staying, as you know, the meeting was great, and we were staying out in the country. There's a lot of tents along the meeting then. and it's quietened down quite a bit since then because oh, Oral Roberts and many others come on the field, so they, it's uh, the revival in America is just about finished. You know that. We're just gleaning now. Just, we're just about all over now. And I think that's the reason I'm warning with all my heart, judgment will follow this sure as the world. It's never been, never been any time yet in history but what judgment followed, and judgment will follow this. And the healing revival is just about finished in America now. And uh, my heart yearns for the overseas, which perhaps in a few months I may make my rest of my stay the rest of my life in the foreign fields. Now, uh, so in this meeting, I had to stay out in the country. Now, I was at a little motel, brother may know if he's from that part of the country, and uh, there was a little, I believe it was a Mennonite restaurant across the, uh, the road, and they were, now the Mennonite people are really fine people. I passed a day and seen a Mennonite hospital here in the city. If I'd break my arm and have to go to the hospital, I hope they take me over to the Mennonite hospital, because I, I like those people. They're really nice. And... Um, they give you always, I believe it's, uh, Gene, how many ounces in a pound? Sixteen, isn't it? They give you seventeen. See? <laughs> so, and uh, they're really nice people. And uh, I was uh, at the restaurant, and the little ladies dressed so nice, clean, and their uh, kitchens were clean, and they were neatly nice ladies, just ever a bit of a real Christian lady. And I really enjoyed eating there. Their food was fine, and so I would go over there and eat. Well, on Sunday, I had eaten for maybe two days, getting ready for the great afternoon service, perhaps, when this lad was converted, or brought to Christ. And so uh, Mr. Baxter was speaking for me, if you remember, the afternoon services in the, in the preliminaries. And so I, I got hungry, and I know I'd just go to preach that afternoon. I wasn't going to have no healing service, so I, I thought, well, it wouldn't hurt me to eat a sandwich. I said, I, I preach so hard usually. I said, and so long, it'll, uh, it'll all be digested before night comes for the healing service. So I said, I went over in the little Mennonite place that closed up, and they'd gone to church, and the place was closed. So I walked across the road to just an ordinary little uh, American stop where they had sandwiches and cold drinks. I hate to say this. It just hurts me because it's our own nation. But to see it's so degrading. When I walked in the place, the first thing was a policeman standing with his arm around a woman in the wrong place playing a slot machine. Now, gambling's illegal in Ohio. Many of you Ohio people know that. And then a policeman, which is supposed to be upholding the law, stand there breaking the law, and a man my age, perhaps had children at home and a wife, stand there with an arm around a woman. I looked, and I thought, oh my. I heard somebody laughing, and I looked back towards the back, and a bunch of these here boys, what did you call them, beatniks, or what? that there flat-looking hair cut on the top, and a duck sitting on the back of their neck or something, overhaul jackets on, or pants pulled way down like this, and... Boys, be a man. You got better making than that. So there they sat back there, and a young lady, not over 17 or 18 years old, and that young lady, the way they were doing, 
pulling around over her. It was a shame. And I thought, well, what about that? I heard somebody say, you think the rain will hurt the rhubarb? <laughs> and I looked over on this side, and there said a woman, I, I'm telling you, I don't, I don't believe this is a place to joke. This is a place to be honest and truthful. And there said a woman that could have been my grandmother. She was sitting there with those little bitty immoral clothes on. And the woman had a purple painted toenail. Now, I've had my toenail purple, but I actually I'd stumped it or something. <laughs> it was purple painted toenail with purple painted manicure on her lips, you know, and, and, and little spots on her face, and the, little, the lady had a real short cut hair and painted blue. Now, I, I, now, that, now that lady's got a right hand and she wants to. See, that's nothing to me. But I, I don't believe the Lord ever made anybody blue hair. I, I, I look real strange. And the poor old thing, old, and or the meat on her arm was flabby, hanging, you know, like that. And so I looked at her, and there's an old man, and it was, I was up summertime, late spring, around May or June. An old fellow sitting there with an army overcoat on, a big scarf wrapped around his neck, two of them drunk. They were sitting there drinking. So they excused themselves and went out and left her alone. I stood there, and I said, Almighty God, Creator of heavens and earth, I come from a mountain top to a rat den, and I said, "How can you, being holy, as I know you are, ever look upon such a scene as that and let it exist? Why don't you just send an earthquake and sink the whole thing?" I said, "The mean that my little Sarah and Rebecca will have to be raised up under such stuff as that." I have to like that young woman back there and look and hear it, that women and hear it and man act in the way they are. And the laws of our land are rotten and polluted. And, and the laws are all right, but then we were trying to enforce it. And such a thing of that, I thought... Yea, what would you have but the love of God? Yea, I say unto thee tonight, my people, wake up. Yea, for I am God and will not stand. Yea, they will not stand, saith God. Shall I not, as he saith, yea, shall not my prophet bring unto thee the future? Yea, and shall I not speak unto thee and say that thou shalt surely perish if thou wilt? Yea, I say, it is thee that shall say what shall be done. Yea, and I say, it is I, God, who shall be taken. Yea, it is I, God, that shall be given unto thee. Yea, and I say, except tonight. Yea, and I say, except to he that is commander of all things. Praise the Lord. Now, I do not know that lady. I don't know who done that interpreting. I do not know this man. But now, if you've got any doubt of whether it was right or not, wait till I finish my story. I wanted God to strike her dead, strike the whole thing out. I felt a real funny feeling. I stepped back behind the door. Listen what he said. It's I, God, that was given. See? And I stepped back behind the door. Now, this is for you Methodist students in the building. Listen to this, and God is my judge. I stepped behind the door, and I said something was going on. And I looked, and it was a vision movie. And I seen the earth. And there was like a, a circle or a mist of red around the earth turning. And I looked like if my eyes focused upon myself on the earth, doing sinful things that I should not do. And every time I started to do something wrong, 
I noticed it would go up before God. And if it wasn't for that misting blood, it, I would have died. But the blood of Jesus act like a bumper on a car. And every time my sin would hit God before God's throne, it looked like it would strike Jesus before it struck the throne, and he'd shake his head. The tears would roll down his cheeks, and he'd say, Father, forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. Then I'd do something else wrong. And then look like it, he was just acting like a bumper between me and death, because God had already pronounced my death the day I sinned. That was the day I died. And then I could not understand why that that mist around the earth. And I looked up there, and then my well, book was open. And that's a vision, just like I see here in the building, only these are just ones that you call. That's one God gave. And I noticed that all, there was my name on a book, and all kinds of sins was wrote against me on that book. And I said, Lord... Did my sins make you suffer like that? And he was crying, the tears was in his face, and, and he looked so weary, his poor drooped down eyes, and I'd see my sins would cause him to suffer. And I said, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that my sins caused you to, to have to suffer for me. Will you forgive me? I promise that I'll, I'll be good and I'll do everything I can if you'll just forgive me. And he touched his side with his hand. And he wrote across that book, pardon. Pushed it over his back and the seal of forgiveness to remember it no more against me. And I fell on my knees and I said, Oh Lord, I can never live long enough to express to you my gratefulness for you forgiving my sins. He said, now, I freely forgive you of everything you've done, and you want to destroy her. That taught me a lesson. When the vision left me, now watch that interpretation. God was given for us. See? Perfectly with the words of, before I said it, and there's people sitting in here from my church and things that's heard me tell that story before and know that that's true. That's exactly. See? Show how perfect that Spirit of God speaking there in unknown tongues and interpreting. Neither one of them knowing me or knowing it. Would I send my prophet weeping? Yea, would I send him seeking, lest it was for thee? Yea, I say unto thee, deny my people the desire God that standeth before thee. Yea, would you not follow me? Yea, was I not the, the one that loved thee? Yea, was I not he that bore thine iniquities? Yea, was I not he that suffered? Yea, wilt thou let me cry? Yea, wilt thou let me weep for thee? Yea, I say unto thee tonight, fear not, for I am standing. Yea, I am standing ready to receive. Wilt thou come, Spirit? Praise the Lord. Listen to that, this is How long will you halt between two opinions? You know what I did? I watched the story as it goes on. I walked out to the woman standing out there. I said, Father, forgive me. I walked out to her. I said, <clears throat> could I sit down? She said, oh, hello. She said, I, I got company. I said, lady, I didn't mean it in that way. I said, I would just like to sat here just a moment until your friends return. I see she was drinking. And uh, she said, very well. And I told her the story that was told me by the vision. She said, I know who you are. She said, you're that Mr. Brandon that's down here in that armory building. 
I said, yes, ma'am, I am. She said, I passed by your meeting the other night. I couldn't get in. She said, Mr. Branham, I'm beyond hopes. She said, my father was a Methodist preacher. I've got two daughters that's Methodist Sunday school teachers. I said, what happened? She told me the story. She said, there's not a hope for me. I said, lady, if there isn't a hope for you, then why did God show me that vision? And there with my hand in hers, I led her right out in the middle of the floor, knelt down there and had a prayer meeting and led her back to God. There might be somebody here that night, tonight in that condition. Grace of God, it's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. I remember that meeting well, son. It reminds me of this, no matter what the person's done, love them. And that's what wins them. Tomorrow afternoon, now, don't forget the services. The Lord willing, we want to pray for the sick. And I want to make this statement before I take my text. That last evening, when the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which I was not by no means intending to have any kind of a service like that, it was completely from my mind, I was going to take my brethren and go down among those people that were sitting here in cot stretchers, dying wheelchairs, and so forth, and stand down there and halt, and I told Brother Herman, that when I sent my brethren down here for him to stand by me, I wanted them to, I just felt after praying and hardly eating all week long, that, that something would happen here that would cause the people to wake up. Only God can only work where there's faith. And I thought the hard preaching and so forth would surely bring the people to a spot and the vindication of the presence of the Holy Spirit would be so perfect that they could not doubt. And in doing so, I I set like that, believing with all my heart that God would do something in that manner. And the first thing you know, the anointing dropped down. It started out there in that building catching those people that were dying out there in condition. And here it comes right down that line, healing those people right down to those cots and stretches, cleaning up the outfit as it went through. The last I remember was somewhere along there. And people rising up out of their wheelchairs and cots and stretchers and being healed, that was about the last thing I remembered. It was such a glorious outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I don't know whether anyone could sit under anointing like that and then turn around and say, No, I, I, don't, I believe that it would be kind of hard for you ever to be healed if, if you could if you couldn't receive it under that, I, I don't think there would be any way of ever getting in anymore, see, under such anointing as that. Now, that was a marvelous time. Now, to be honestly, since I left, I've been constantly in revival since December. And now I've been in places where the people are packed and bigger meetings and things, but I never know any time that the Holy Spirit ever anointed with such unction for healing as it was right here last night. That's right. And I'm so thankful for it. And you just remember that there's people that was here last evening that you'll hear from them. They're, they're healed and don't know it. See? They, they're they just expecting that something might have happened to them all spontaneously. It don't have to come like that. As long as there's something there that says, yes, that settles it. I don't care. I don't care. Fix it. So, you ministers remember it. in your churches, you'll be seeing people coming saying, well, you know, I, I, I just don't have it anymore, see? And then my son was telling me that a lady come by, maybe here now, saying, look at my child's eyes, take the glasses off, so he just cross-eyed, pull the glasses off, and Billy said the eyes are straighter than his. So it's just, it's just, that's what it is. See, nobody touched them. See, that's what I'm trying to get to the people is that... It's not whether we touch you or not, it's you touching him. It's your faith that heals you. Now, tonight, let's bow our heads just a moment as we pull back the pages of the book. And then so, get quiet. Lord Jesus, we are approaching thy throne of mercy again. And asking for divine guidance tonight that 
you might direct us in our thoughts and our th- knowing tonight that our hearts are more than happy. As David said of old, my cup runneth over. And how that we know after a meeting like that last night, it seemed like, Lord, that this entire city would be a set of fire. But where are they? Lord, truly, how could we but believe that you ordained them to life or by your foreknowledge you knew who would receive you and who would not? How can a man come that when God has him called him or ordained him to life? So we realize as it's been through the ages, so is it now, that poor, miserable, blinded human beings Yet many kind-hearted people, nice people, that live a good, righteous life as far as morals is concerned, and yet are totally lost and gone, without hope, without God, without mercy, in this dark, dying hour. Father, my heart bleeds and pleads. I don't know what else to do. But just keep giving my voice that at that day it'll be on magnetic tape in the glory. And I pray that you'll continue to be with us and help us. Bless the services to Mars, my ministering brother, his minister around in their churches. Oh, may there be fire from heaven on every altar, grant it, Lord. May there be great services throughout the country and throughout the land tomorrow, and save all that is savable. Bless the services tonight in these few words, Lord, that's been uh, read this afternoon here in the Scripture and where I've chosen to speak a few words tonight. May it be so that many will receive faith and believe on Jesus, for we ask that in his name. Amen. Usually messages come in three. They can't be over three messages at a time, according to the Scripture. But that's the third message, and it might be the Holy Spirit trying to get it to somebody, so be real reverent, everybody. Yea, thou that hath ear to hear, let him hear that which the Scripture hath to say. And now I have said unto my disciples, as I approach them on the road to Emmaus, that if they would only believe, and if they had their hearts open unto the Scriptures, as I spoke unto them words of life, their hearts burned within them. If thou would only open thine eyes, that thou might see, thy ears, that they might hear, thou would believe and should receive the glory of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I would draw from that that they would be like that Jesus, here is my prayer to him over those messages. God, let it be tonight when you shut us in like you did those who came from Emmaus. And may we see tonight you do something among us like you did before your crucifixion, that the world that's here tonight or the church might know that you have raised from the dead. Maybe, how did they know he was the same Jesus? Because he did the same thing that he did. Now, please, everyone, keep your seat and be real rare. I ask you in Jesus' name, be seated, be real reverent. And listen, now the Holy Spirit has spoke to a certain type of gift of tongues and interpretation. There's not one thing in that that I would dishonor, but believe it come from God. And I come before I read the scriptures. It's not supposed to be said while we're preaching. The spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophet. And now it come orderly, all right. And now 
it seems like that is trying to press that God is going to do something. However, I haven't given out any prayer cards for a healing service, but something may take place, I don't know. But did you notice what it was? That Jesus, when he, they thought he was crucified and was gone, but he talked to them all day long and they did not know him. And then that night he got him in the room and shut the door when he was in the inn. Then he'd done something just like he did. No one else did it like that. And he did it just the way he did before his crucifixion. And, they, and then what did he do? He vanished in the dark. And they run all the way back to their people and saying that truly Jesus had raised from the dead. They knew it. For they knew he did something just like he did before his crucifixion was a proof that it was the same Jesus raised from the dead. May he do the same thing, and when we leave here tonight, going to our different homes, may we be able to say like those who came from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? 1 Corinthians 14th chapter, the 8th verse. For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? And I'm going to speak on the subject of the uncertain sound. Now, Paul was speaking, isn't that strange, upon the same thing here about giving tongues and interpretations. The uncertain sound. Now, we live in a day of uncertainty. We live in the day when there's everything almost that we can put our hands on natural is uncertain. There's so much uncertainty to uh, the nations are, are quaking. There's uncertainty in our national security. There is no nation safe anymore. We could either be the, the victims to Russia by midnight tonight or either be in bits. It depends on what Russia wants to do about it. We're talking about our scientists. They have man that they can put 200 miles in the air and a little machine to come right over, set them right over top of this nation send our message down and say, either surrender or we pull a lever, and that's all of it. They don't have to wait till tomorrow to do it. They can do it right now. If we're sensible, what would we do? What would the, the Pentagon, what would the, the, the nation do? It would surrender. It'd have to. Then what would happen? Wave after wave of Russian soldiers and Climb into our country here, ravishing our women, taking your homes and kicking you out in the street and shoot you and kill your children before you and take over the nation. Then we know what sin, how we've been, what it meant to laugh in the face of a religious service and call them a bunch of holy rollers. Or Remember, it's coming. There's no national security. We, we, we're at... We're, we're, we're Balthasar's feast again. They thought because they were inside those big walls, the best of, of the scientists, the best chariots, they could run three or four chariots abreast around that wall of Babylon and, and without moving or losing a horse or a chariot. And the great big gates that was probably half a or 40, 50 feet wide like that. There was no nation could get to them or anything else, so they just lived in sin any way they wanted to. But God can look over the top of the wall. And they had a, a regular a big tea party one night or a big drunken spree, what it was. Something like some of our modern television programs where they, after they got all good and drunk, they thought they could... Uh, crack a few jokes about the bald-headed preacher or something like that, and what happened? They went and got the vessels of the Lord and drank wine in them to make fun. And that night, that was, you remember, that was the beginning of the Gentile kingdom. I want to ask you people something that might be a little critical. 
Anyone that knows the Bible knows that God began, dealt with the Jews until King Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, was the beginning of the Gentile Empire. He ends out in the feet in Rome. Is that right, brother? You Bible student? Watch what happened. What did he do at the end of that kingdom? There come a handwriting on the wall that was in unknown tongues. No one could interpret it. But they had a man that had the gift of interpretation. So he came and read the handwriting on the wall. And it's been read here again tonight by the same kind of a spirit given by the same God. The handwriting's on the wall. All the time that we've been spending our money and jokes and all, we've become just a big bunch of jokesters. Laughing at religion, making fun of it, and all the time Russia has been putting things in the air that's so far ahead of us, they are years and years and years ahead of us. Right. You remember the Medes of Persia was at the gate waiting when these things happened, and they know nothing about it. There's no more national security. When they tell you we're secure, that we can do this or do that, they're mistaken. Dig a hole in the ground, some of this year, national defense stuff, and run into the ground, and that bomb will blow a hole in the ground 150 feet deep, 100 miles square. Well, if you were 5,000 feet under the earth, you'd be in the lava. And if you were 5,000 feet under the earth, the shock would break every bone in your body. So you can't dig down and get away from it. There's no way at all to escape it. There's only one shelter that you can get under. Amen. And that shelter is not made of steel. Amen. It's made of feathers Amen. under his wings. Amen. No. Amen. That's the only shelter. Go up above it. The rapture coming. Now, there's unsettled peace. You don't have to think great big nations like Russia, little bitty nations can do it. We're just at the end of the road. And man, what are they doing? One, we selling a whole lot of stuff to one nation, trying to buy friendship with our money. And the very Indian that we're taking the money from, or taking the land from, we're starving to death out there on the prairie, taking his sheep away from him, and letting him live out there with TV and everything else in a tent. And then sending money overseas, over there calling it national defense, trying to buy friendship. You can't buy a friendship. <laughs> Spending millions of dollars every year for whiskey and beer and our missionaries on the field starving to death. Right. Oh, sure. We're gone. The nation's gone. All nations are gone. Not only this nation. I think this is a queen of nations. It's a true. It's a great life civilization we have. But she's finished. It's all over. We're just ready for the coming of the law. Amen. Right. Church, make yourself ready. By the time I get through tomorrow afternoon, if the Lord willing, you see if it isn't right. Now, with the, with the word of the law, see if that isn't true. Now, remember that we cannot put confidence in any security place on the nations anymore. We go to Russia, it's a be that we'll blow them. If they say here, they'll blow us. If we go to Japan, we'll be just the same thing. She's ready to rock to pieces right now. And there's no way you can stop it. Because they have neglected to do exactly what God told them to do. And instead of preach the gospel, they have built buildings and had fine scholarships and educations. They've used their own idea to educate people to it. And this man that's on trial, this German now, smart, intelligent, intellectual giant, and take this Eichmann that throws them people to death and turn the hot water on them and kill the millions. And when I was in Germany, there in those places where they tuck them out there and give them that bubble in their vein, Hitler and send them out there, and smart, educated scientists way beyond while we was half the war was over before we ever had a gun that could compare with their 88. How about you soldiers that faced it? You know that right. While we were so far ahead of us in science and smart and everything like that and would turn and do a thing like that, it's insanity. Amen. And any young people that can stand in a building with their hands up and always carrying on a rock and roll and stuff and beat that, it's insanity. Yeah. 
that's dangerous. They've gone. The mental faculties is broke down. And remember, the tree of knowledge only goes so far and it swings backward. So there we have no, no uh, sound of security in national defense. Our jobs. We have no security in our, our jobs. It's all uncertain. Let a man pass about 35 years old. They'll root you out. They'll get a young man so they won't have to retire you. And after you pass 40 years old, you try to get a job even digging a ditch. You'll have to have a high school diploma before you can do it. And they've got a little button they can press and take care of that anyhow. Your job, you ain't got no security in your jobs. I don't know how true this is, but I've been told that there's more people out of work right now than there was during the time of President Hoover's depression, because there's more people. What's the matter? It's just a place where there's no certainty in these things. You're not certain of your job. Somebody can take your place in the morning. Politics. Let's just talk a while tonight. This is Saturday night. Politics. Crooked both sides. Just so crooked as crooked can be. It proved it in this last election. When the FBI exposed it, that they had machines that every time they voted for one for Mr. Uh, Nixon, they had they vote for Kennedy at the same time, and they proved it. And what did they do about it? Nothing. Now, I'm not a Democrat nor a Republican, neither one. I'm a Christian. So one pop can't call Kittle black or greasy. One's just as black as the other one, just as dirty as the other one. But what's the matter? It's because that there's no security in those things. It's played out. The great House of Commons of England one time said about democracy, said democracy is all sails and no anchor. Said it'll come to pass that politicians will stand on soapboxes and make elections in America and pay their way in for that exactly right. But he didn't think about his own nice, lovely House of Lords to do the same thing. So it shows that all these things are rotten and decaying because there's coming a kingdom whose founder, a city, whose builder and maker is God. These things has to give away. Politics is all, I believe democracy, certainly I'm an American, and I believe in democracy, but oh my, at the rotten things that's in democracy, that's it. So it shows that all these man-made earthly ideas has to give away to a kingdom that's coming. I've had the privilege of standing on the grounds in Egypt where the Pharaohs stood in, murdered the people, the gladiators and so forth. You dig 20 feet under the earth to get their kingdom where it's set. I stood where the Pharaohs stood. I stayed where the, in the, the great Colosseums and, and the different places and in Rome and, the, and in the Pharaohs and so forth and their kingdoms has fallen and instead of just looking out here to see me have to dig down to find the ruins of them. Show that every man-made kingdom, every man-made system has to give away. So you see, I don't care what kind of a democracy, how many UNs we build, how many League of Nations or anything we got, it's all decaying. Time is filled with Swiss translation. No earth unmoved will stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold oh, to God's unchanging hand. When this journey is completed, and to God you have been true, fair and bright your home in glory, your enraptured soul shall view. That's right. Thank God. Hear how much money you could make, or how many buildings you could build, or how much presidents you could come of any company. It's falling, crumbling. Thoughts in my mind now that third angel's message that went forth. Martin Luther, John Wesley, and the next angel. 
What did the last angel's message say when he crossed the three angels? Back with his father, his father, become the habitation of every unclean spirit. That's exactly where it's at. Sure, we have no security in our nation. It's uncertain everywhere. Uncertainty is uncertain in your job. Uncertainty in politics. Uncertainty in the Democrat Party. Uncertainty in the, the Republican Party. Uncertainty in all the parties. And in the church, it's also uncertainty. How can we have about 900 different organizations and every one of them dipping one to the other and fussing with one another? How can a poor laity know what to do? How can the people know where to stand? One say, we got it over here, and another say, we got it over here, and we got it down here. What does the people know what to do? It's uncertainty. The church gives an uncertain sound. Politics gives an uncertain sound. The nation gives an uncertain sound. Employment gives an uncertain sound. Oh, I can speak of a hundred things. It's uncertain. No certainty to it. The Methodist Church says, we got it. The Baptist Church says, you're lying, we got it. The Presbyterian says, you both have your line, we got it. The Pentecostal says, we got it. Just look how we break up and fuss and stew and everything that shows we haven't got it. Amen. Exactly right. Amen. So that's an uncertain sound. The uncertain sound, you can't, you say, well, we go to get a hole and dig in the ground for national security. Try it one time, see what happens. And I got a job, brother, I got a promise, just let them change bosses once. <laughs> Home life is uncertain. A man can marry a nice little woman, get her back out of the country here where she's not polluted. Take her into a home and set a television in there, and the first thing you know, you come home, she's acting like some of these movie stars. Uncertainty in home life. Let her kids run out on the street with dirty faces and out the street playing and hold a little snotty-nosed dog in her arm and give it a child's love. Pack a little old dog around in the car and practice birth control. Shame on American women. That's horrible to say that. I don't know, but this is one time you're going to hear it anyhow. If you just sit still and don't keep, keep going out. One can just hold so much and then they have to explode and run. But, uh, but listen, that's true. It's the truth. Somebody's got to cry out against that thing. And there's many a fine preacher, brethren, standing in the pulpit that knows that's the truth. But what is their pulpit? It's a meal ticket to them. I'd rather lay on my belly and drink branch water and eat salty crackers and preach the truth than to have fried chicken three times a day and have to compromise. Tell the truth, because you've got the answer for it at the day of the judgment. Certainly, the uncertainty, uncertainty. All we find, then you say, Brother Branham, you're putting us on a limb out here. That's right. So that you'll know where you're at. You say, then, Brother Branham, is there anything that has a certain sound? Yes, sir. There is one thing that has a perfect certain sound. What is it? It's the Word of God. It's a certain sound. It's perfect. It's an eternal sound. Are you sure that Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24, chapter 35th verse, He said, Heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. My hopes is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. My soul gives way that he's all my hope and stay. For on Christ that solid rock I stand. All other grounds is sinking sand. All other grounds is sinking sand. 
chapter. Now, the Word of God, His promises, they're true. Now, there's only one thing to approach anything. Like Israel. Israel was a perfect type of this nation. Israel was a God-fearing people that was in bondage to, an, to the Egyptians. And they left that land of bondage, took a pilgrimage. Listen now, don't you fail to get this. Make God open your understanding. They left their land of pilgrimage and come to their promised land and drove back the occupants and inhabited the land. Is that right? We did the same thing. We were under Catholicism and bondage of, and we wanted to be a God-fearing people that loved God and had freedom of religion, and we came to this nation and drove back the occupants and possessed the land. As long as when Israel started out, they had God-fearing leaders. David, Solomon, they brought a respect while Israel was known all over the world, all the nations, and they all respected them. That showed what God could do with a bunch of men and women that feared him and lived godly before him. As I preached a few nights ago, even the Queen of the South come all the way across the Sahara Desert three months on a camel to hear the wisdom of Solomon. The whole world looked to him. And when this nation was founded, we had godly men who founded it. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln. Valley Forge and prayed all night long. That leader and bullets went through his coat the next day without, miss, without hitting him. Abraham Lincoln, a God-fearing man. What did we do a few days ago? We did the same thing Israel did. Elected Ahab to the, to the White House. Now, Ahab was a pretty good sort of a feller. He wanted to repent. But Jezebel, he was married to her and he couldn't do it. She was a net that turned the head. And we did the same thing. Put a man up there that's married to that Jezebel system that we run from and become a free nation from. Oh, you politicians that sold your birthright of Christianity. I'll stop on that. Let's go back. God's promise that God said it would happen, Revelation 13, so there's no way of getting around it. I just want you to know where you're standing and what you did. And some of my precious colored people that voted a ticket like that, why, you brought disgrace to the blood of Abraham Lincoln and took the slave belt from your fathers. Exactly, I wouldn't have thought you would have done it. Ma, don't you know what you did? Why did you sell out to a, a few extra dollars? The God of the belly instead of the God of the heart. That's what the nations has gone to is a few extra dollars. That's what's the matter with Ahab. Brother, they had one old prophet down there and he didn't compromise with them. He blasted them out. Every one of the organizations kicked him out. They hated him. But he sure told them what was right. And when he got through blasting that old painted up Jezebel, <laughs> about them women, the way they were acting, they all hated him. But one day God said, you preached long enough, get out there in the wilderness, now I'm going to send judgment. And it did. He did. Oh, it's the hour that we're living, friends. But there's one thing sure, one thing sure, when we see our nation gone, we see the world gone, there's one thing that's eternally sure, and that's God's Word. What God said, God will keep His Word. Let's just take a few characters that I have written on a piece of paper here that I'd like to refer to, a few characters. That was sure. 
And you can be sure, you cannot be sure of God's Word if you just read it. God's got to speak through the Word to you. Now, Noah, Noah was just as sure it was going to rain as it could be. He was certain of it. It wasn't no uncertain sound when God said, Noah, build a house, an uh, ark to prepare for the saving of your household. That was no uncertain sound. It seemed like to the people it was uncertain. When some wild man farmer got some silly idea in his head that he was going to build a way on an ark and it never rained or dew and never fell from heaven or anything, I'd hear the critics say, Say, Mr. Noah, tell me, well, where's the rain coming from? Well, Noah might have said something like this, I am certain that was the voice of Almighty God. Well, how's the rain coming? If that was God's voice said it's coming, God's able to put it up there to fall down. He was certain it was going to rain. Because God's Word said so, it was certain, and He knew it was certain. As I started to speak this morning, when it was interrupted by having to leave, Moses. He was a great military man, we're told, by historians. And he tried within himself, knowing he was called to the ministry. Now, brethren, this is a lesson for us all. He knew he had a call in the ministry. We know that ourselves. But let's watch what we do with it. Moses knew his mother had taught him that he was to be the deliverer. He was born a proper child, and how he was nurtured by his mother and brought up right under Pharaoh's doorstep, and really had his foot on the throne. He knew that he was to be God's deliverer, but he tried to do it in his own system. And we know we're ministers that God called us, but let's not try to do it by seeing how many we get in our organization. If we do, we're going to make the same mistake they make. Let's follow the Spirit. Let's go with God. Moses had maybe never heard the voice of God. But he knew by intellectual, he knew by feeling inside of him that he was the deliverer. But he tried to do it and failed, so he said, maybe I made a mistake. There might be preachers sitting out here the same way that thought you made a mistake. When you found your failure, you just never waited long enough. The Bible said, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Now up with wings like an eagle. Moses thought that maybe he had missed his calling. But one day when God spoke to him face to face and he heard the word of God, my angel spoke to him, and it co- co- coincides with the Word. When he saw that the voice that spoke to him was the same thing the Word had promised, then he had faith, and he was certain that he was going down there. He was certain Israel was going to come out from under the bondage. Because God made the promise. It was a scriptural promise. And the voice spoke to Moses, and said, I have heard the cries of my people, and I have remembered my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I am sending you down to deliver them. You know, when a man really follows God's Word, sometimes he acts silly to the world. Could you imagine an old man building on an ark, standing there building an ark? It was silly to the world. And as I said, an old man now uh, here, 80 years old, looked like if God was going to use him, he'd have used him when he was a little curly-headed boy. Or when he's just at his best in his education. Take 40 years to knock that out of him so he could use him. Taking 40 years to take out of him what Pharaoh and his education put in him. Taking three years for God to take it out of Paul down in Arabia. To get him back to God, not him back to the Word. Of all, out of all the great, as good as it was, the theology he learnt by Gamaliel. And as fine as his theology was that he, uh, Moses learned from Pharaoh, yet taking God 40 years to get it all out of him. One morning when God spoke to him, 
The next morning he become a wild man to the people. Let God speak to anybody. And in the eyes of the world, they become crazy. And I don't mean a, a fanatic. I mean a solid man or woman that comes to God. He takes the fanaticism out of you. Now we find out that Moses, the next morning, here he was with his wife sitting on a mule and his little boy Gershom on her hip and a cold crooked stick in his hand and here he was going down on the road to Egypt to take over. As I said, a one-man invasion going down to take over. Where are you going, Moses? Going down to Egypt. What are you going to do? Take over. What are you going to do it with? This stick. Who said so? God did. And settled it. All right. He was just as certain of that as he could be. With that old dry stick, but this old dry stick in the hands of God means more than every machine gun that could be turned toward me. Yes. One little ignorant, illiterate boy out there. In the hands of God, with not enough education to know his ABCs could bring more power of God out of heaven than all the doctors of theology in this United States. Forgetting all of his theology. He didn't have to polish up on nothing. For God. And he was certain it was God. He was certain that he was going to deliver him. How's he going to feed two and a half million people without a bite to eat? A bunch of slaves out there in the wilderness. How's he going to do it? He was certain God would do something about it. Brother Randy, when you preach divine healing, as people in heart trouble this. How are you going to how are you going to make it work? I don't have any my business to make it work. Amen. That's God's business to do that. Amen. But just as certain as I know his word is true, he sent that angel and said so, and somewhere in here somebody will get healed. Amen. Certainly that is understanding. Something's going to come forth because he said so. I don't know who it is, where it's at, but it'll be there. Who is it? I don't know. It's none of my business who it is. Somebody will be saved. How do you know? God has said so. I'm certain of it. I'm positive of it. Brother Bram, you've had an awful struggle. I thought you said the Lord led you over here. He did. What do you think good will come out of it? I don't know. But I'm certain he sent me here. I'm certain that he's doing something. I don't know what it is. But I'm certain he's doing it. Because of his word. No guesswork. I know it's true. <laughs> when Abraham, a man 75 years old, his wife 65, God met him one day and said, Abraham, we'll give you a, a baby by your wife, Sarah. She was bearing him sterile, I suppose. And here they was after all these years. Well, God, well, Abraham is just as positive he's going to have that baby as anything. I can imagine him say, Sarah, knit a bunch of little booties and get you some bird eye and some diaper pins and let's get started. We're getting ready. We're going to have it. Hallelujah. What a sound city. What if he went out to the doctor and said, uh, Doctor, uh, wife and I won't make arrangements to the hospital to have a baby. The doctor said, oh, oh, certainly, Mr. Abram. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Say, say would, you turn, would you call a psychiatrist or the psychiatric ward somewhere? That old man's went off of his head. But he was certain God was going to do it. The first 28 days. How you feeling, honey? There's no difference. Glory to God, and that's as certain as a walk through. Five years passed. How you feeling, sweetheart? Not a bit of difference. I'm 70 years old now. Yes, and Abraham's 80. That, that I'm just as certain as anything is going to happen. Twenty-five years passed. Now she's ninety and he's a hundred. How you feeling, sweetheart? No different. Glory to God, we're going to have it anyhow. God, he was certain God keeps his word. He was fully persuaded that God was able to perform that what he had promised. Certain. You're certain when God reveals it to you. If God would reveal that little girl sitting there, she's going to walk. <laughs> uh, but the devil could send every demon he's got out of hell. That man sitting there in a wheelchair, whoever you are, 
It wouldn't stop you. Oh, there ain't nothing can stop you when God says so. That's settled. There in Finland, that little boy had been laying on the ground there dead. And I've got that documented and signed. Pronounced dead, went got the mother and father before the undertaker could take him. He was laying there, and I come down, I said, that's that little boy I seen two years ago in America. There stood about 500 people, the mayor of the city. I said to Miss Isaac, interpret this. She did. I said, if that baby doesn't raise from that dead, laying there dead, every bone in his body broke through, wound him up like that and threw him out, even his, his little feet and things, and threw his socks and his shoes off of him and everything. If that baby isn't standing on his feet, in five minutes from now, I'm a false prophet and a liar and run me out of this country. Why, well, I was certain that was God that showed me the vision. It has to be so. There's nothing can stop it. Amen. Amen. That night in India, before all those people, when the rage all was on their pillars and the holy man sitting all around, and I've been in the temple of the Sikhs and James that day, and they made fun of Christianity. Said a very idea. Said a Christ dying when they won't even kill a flea, mop the floor as they go to keep them stepping on an ant, afraid it's, they believe in reincarnation, think it might be some of the relatives. How could you preach to them a blood sacrifice? I said, let God speak as God. Some of us has got to be wrong. I picked up the Koran in one hand, the Bible in the other, and I said, something's wrong somewhere. Let the God that's real God speak. Hallelujah. About that time they brought a blind man up there. I said, I cannot heal the man. Of course not. I said, his name is spelled R-A-J-A-P-H-E-W, like that. That's right. I said, he's a beggar. His wife's a little thin woman. He's got two boys. One of them is six and the other is eight. Correct. Standing out there at that anointing, them rage all sitting out there, and them holy man said, he's reading their mind. I thought, oh, them hypocrites. <laughs> then I looked back and I thought, God, if you just do something. I looked back. Here's a vision. There he stood looking around in the vision. Oh, brother. No. No. Something happened. I said, I challenge every Mohammedan priest in here. Every priest of Buddha. You Sikhs and Jans that made fun of Christianity. Come here and give him his sight. Surely the God that created him, if you, he said, I'll serve the God that gives me my sight. I said, oh, of course, you say he's wrong. He's a sun worshiper. Sure, he's worshiping the creation instead of the creator. I said, you, what would you James do? You just cross a light and make him a Jane. What would you Mohammedans do? Do the same thing. What would you Buddhists do? The same thing. It's the psychology. We got the same thing in America. I said, all the Methodists wants to make all the Baptists Methodists. And the Pentecostal wants to make all the Methodists Pentecostal. It's just, it's just psychology, that's all. But I said, surely the God that made him, hallelujah, the God that made him ought to do something about it. Amen. Well, you think I'd have said that? Not for no reason if I hadn't seen that vision. <laughs> I know what was going to happen. If the devil couldn't do nothing about it then. If he'd show a vision that George Washington was going to rise from the dead in the morning, I'd invite the whole world to stand watch it done. For it's the Word of God. I've seen those visions for 52 years and not one has ever failed in all my life. It's God. No uncertainty about it. It's certain. I said, now you Mohammedans to say you're the predominant religion. Come give me my sight and I'll be your disciple. You Buddhists, you come give him his sight and I'll be your disciple. You holy man, come give him his sight. Tens of thousands times thousands, laying in them big fields like that. There sits the mayor of the city. Got his name and address. You want to write to him and ask him. There he said, I said, why don't I sit your awful still crown? What's the matter with you? You were telling me today how little Christianity was, how great your religion was. I said, Look at you people out there. Look at your priests. What's the matter with them? They call me a fanatic. An American soapbox salesman. Sudden religion like I was on a soapbox because I shook my arms when the Holy Spirit was on me. I said, let them come forth there to give this man his sight. Hallelujah. 
watching that vision. I said, why don't you come? Because you can't. And neither can I. But the God of heaven who raised up his son, Christ Jesus, that gave the vision to me just now that I saw that that man was standing here with his sight. I saw him in the vision. If he doesn't give him his sight, then I'm a false prophet and run me out of India. If he does give his sight, how many of you Mohammed's Buddhas and all of you will receive Christ as your Savior? Just black hands as far as you can see. The brain in here. Put my arms on him. I said, Lord Jesus, no more to say that. He'd get a holler something like that. He could see as good as I could. Run, grab the mayor of the city, running up and down like that. What was it? It's the same Bible. God's word is just as real tonight as it ever was. He's even testified to the president. This coming October, they got an ample theater. They can put a million people in it in New Delhi where they're having their convention wanting to come up. Certainly, he's still God, but you, have, you just can't sit because you think it in your mind. You've got to know it. You've got to know and the Word's got to come to you. You've got to know that it's true. Old Elijah that day, when he took all those sacrifices and said, let's prove who's God. Said, uh, see if he was certain about it. He said, uh, you, you go ahead first. Said, you, there's a whole bunch of you. There's 400 of you priests here. Said, you make the sacrifice and let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And they were sincere. They wasn't hypocrites. Said, they cut the sacrifice and they climbed up on the altar. Elijah walked around and said, say, uh, maybe he's pursuing. He might be taking a nap. What was the matter? He was certain. <laughs> He saw a vision. He said so. And when he cut and poured all the water on the altar, he said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel. His prince name. Not, the, not his deceiver's name. Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel. Let it be known this day that you're God and I'm your prophet. And I've done all of this at your command. Amen. Hallelujah. When you meet God's conditions, call for the fire. Let the Pentecostal church forget their organization, denominational difference. Let these people throw themselves into tears around the altar. And let these people come with one accord in one place and begin to cry out to God and get things right. There will be another Pentecost take place in the powers of God will work got to do it at his command. You can't do it as long as you say, well, I know I, I'm supposed to believe this, but really the Bible says this, but I, 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 I. You, you, you don't whip to start with. Right. Right. Oh, I know our church says the days of miracles have happened, but really I believe or not. See, you're whipped. You'll never get in a war like that. That's an uncertain sound. You don't know what to do. Be certain. Whose word's certain? God's! If your church says the days of miracles have passed, the Bible said he's the same yesterday and forever. Let every man's word be a lie and mine be true, said God. Amen. That sounds uncertain. Shake hands with the preacher, give him the right hand of fellowship, and come and make a confession. The devil did the same thing. He believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He absolutely did it. Cain built an altar and worshipped just as much as any other religious person did. Made a sacrifice and done a great, put his money on the altar, his goods, and and laid down sincerely and threw his hands up to God in worship. God blankly refused him. That's right! You've got to be certain, brethren. You've got to know it's God speaking. He did that on his own ideas. Abel done it by divine revelation of God. Listen to the Word of God. But when everything got right, David, he was certain Walked up there one day and that big old glass stand out there and said, There's a miracle to It's all gone. Look so many old when the devil thinks he's got the edge on you. Brother, he can blow and pop. Yes, he can. Stand out there and said, I'll tell you, let some of you men over there, some of you theologians come over and attack me. Mm-hmm. See, I'll tell you what I'll do, you know. But one day he said it at the wrong time. <laughs> there happened to be a little ruddy fellow, naughty, little bitty old guy. Little sheepskin coat all wrapped up there, maybe about weigh about 110 pounds, hair hanging down in his eyes. Stop 
said, who is this over there defying the armies of, of the word of the living God? Who is that over there saying that? Oh, that's Goliath. He said, are you going to stand and let that uncertain high denomination say that the days of miracles is past when our God said he's the same yesterday and forever? Boy, oh, it hit the wrong guy. Yes, sir. They might compromise, but he said, I don't. They pulled him up before the bishop, <clears throat> Saul. He said, now, I'll tell you what you have to do, son. Before you get into the ministry, you'll have to take four years of college training. You'll have to get a Ph.D. and an LLD. And he said, uh, after getting all this on, and they put it on that poor old fellow's bowl, he couldn't hold it up. <laughs> That's just about the way we go with <laughs> He said, take the stuff off of me. <laughs> Saul found out right quick that his ecclesiastical best didn't fit a man of God. His man-made dogmas, he wasn't bound down to it. No, sir. He said, let me go with what I got confidence in. He said, wait a minute, Saul, I want to talk to you. I know this is just a slingshot. I don't know about them old ones. How you're supposed to stand and say, Amen. How you're supposed to do all this? And, uh, I don't know about that. So, so listen, I know why, what I'm talking about. Said, one day I was herding my father's sheep. Amen. 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 And said, a bear come in and got one. Now I went after him. This thing shot and brought him back. He said, then a lion come in and got one and took it out. A lamb. Said, I took this thing shot and went out and knocked him down. When he rose up, I killed him. I brought the sheep back. That is the God who delivered that line into my hands and that bear into my hands. How much more will he deliver that uncircumcised flesh into my hands? Hey, man, he was certain he knew what he was talking about. Listen, it's true. I say my his and haint and tote and fetch and carry and maybe a many man here in your pastor might not have any P-H-L-L-Q-U-R-S-T, all kinds of stuff on his name. We know what we're talking about. Right. right. We may be called holy rulers and insane and all excited and everything, but we know what we're talking about. Amen. Let me tell you. The devil, I don't care how much they preach against divine healing, how much you say the days of miracles is past, I'm herding my father's sheep. A cancer took one and run off. I ain't got no Ph.D., but I got an F-A-I-T-H, so come after me. I'll bring the hell out of 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 the hell Watch what he done. He picked up five stones, the number of grace, J-E-S-U-S. Put it in his hand, F-A-I-T-H. F-A-I-T-H-N-J-E-S-U-S. Here he comes. Oh, sheep. You that the devil's packed off somewhere and say you have to fill a premature grave, I'm coming after you! Amen. I want to bring you back to the shady green pastures. Still water. Eat with the rest of the flock. Oh, yeah, I see what he was talking about. He was certain it was God. He was certain. No uncertainty about that said, How much more will God deliver him into my hands? Oh, people, forgive me. I thought it was 7.30. <laughs> Give me ten more minutes, will you? I'll watch. I'll set my clock to alarm if necessary. If you just... I got an alarm on here anyhow, but I'm ashamed to set it. But, brother, sister, this is true. Amen. Right. If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound... Notice, when, let's just take another person right quick. When Simeon, it was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost that he wasn't going to see death until he seen the large Christ. He was a man of reputation. He had a Ph.D., double L, D, Q, R, S, D, too. But the Holy Ghost revealed to him. And he wasn't ashamed. He ran around telling everybody, an old man over 80 years old. They made fun of the old fellow with one foot in the grave and slipping, but the other said he's going to see the cry. But he, uh, he was certain 
He had a right for his testimony, so for the Holy Ghost revealed it to him. Amen. He stood there and he saw him too. When Jesus was on earth, Jesus was certain of the Father's word. He said, you destroy this temple and I'll raise it up again in three days. Not I'll try to. Maybe it will. Perhaps it'll work. <laughs> he was certain. Why? Wow. David said so. I'll not suffer my Holy One to see corruption, neither I'll leave his soul in hell. He knew corruption set in in three days. Somewhere within that three days, he'd rise again. He believed the Father's word. Destroy this temple and I'll raise it up again in three days. I will, not I'll try to. When Martha come to him and said, uh, said our, our brother Lazarus, Lord, if you'd have been here, he would not have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will do it. He said, I'm the resurrection and life, saith God. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? He said, Yea, Lord. Oh, I, I, I think so, Lord. I, I'm pretty sure that they tell me that you're just a Beelzebub. They tell me you read people's minds. Uh -uh, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah, Lord! Oh, I believe! Glory to God. I believe that you are the Son of God that was to come into the world. Uh oh Something's got to happen. Listen, that positive. That positive. When two straight ultimates meet, something has to happen. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, sure it does. So, I believe that you are the Son of God that was to come into the world. What did Jesus say to her? What did he say? Well, I'll tell you what, where are you buried? I'll go down and try and see what I can do about it. Mm -mm. I'll go down and ask the Father and see what he'll do. Oh, no. Uh -uh. He didn't say that. He said, I'll go and wait. Right There's nothing uncertain about that. That's right. I'll go and wait. I will. Not I'll go try. I will. He knew exactly what God had showed him, and he knew it was going to happen. I'll go and wait. No uncertain sound in that. No, sir. Not a bit of uncertainty about that. Oh, destroy this body. I'll raise it up in three days. Jesus said, if I, if you be in me, and my word in you, you can ask what you will and it'll be done to you. It, it maybe it'll be done to you. No, no, there's no uncertainty about that. I will, it will be done, it shall be done. Amen. Is that right? Amen. When he looked at that fig tree and cursed it, and 24 hours later he come by and it was withered. Peter said, look, the tree's already withering. Jesus said, have faith in God. For verily, verily, I say unto you, if you, not me, but you, hey, man, brother, if you say to this mountain, not if I say, but if you say to this mountain, be moved and plucked up and cast into the sea and walk down. But believe that what you have said shall come to pass, you shall have it. <laughs> Not maybe you will. Not maybe you will. But you will. Sinner man. Paint this dark picture you get the first of my sermon. About the hour we're standing. Let me quote you a word. Think of it. St. John 5, 24. 5. Handful, two dozen of eggs. Read it when you go home. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. If your nation's breaking, if your homes are breaking, if your nerves are breaking, if your healths are breaking, if your hopes is breaking, everything breaking. But Jesus Christ said this. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come to the judgment, but hath passed from death unto life. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Not he may, he shall. He has. He may in the future, but he has now. He has passed from death unto life. 
it is alive right now. I wish I was twice my size. Maybe I feel twice as good. I'd have to be twice my size to do it. Oh, God, how can I ever thank you? Positive. Down through the ages, she's never buried. A little old church that believed that that word of God waved right to every persecution. They've tried to stamp it out, burn it out, persecute it out, kill it out, drown it out. And she waved on. Amen. Amen. Some time ago, standing in the Statue of Liberty, a little bunch of sparrows that laying dead. I said, what's the matter? I said, there's a storm last night. And that big light was beaming out and those little birds was lost. If they just know to tuck that light, they could run on to safety. But said, so what was they trying to do? They run up here and tried to beat the light out. If what did they do? said, so they beat their brains out. Trying to put out the light. The light that could happen. You cold formal Pentecostals. You cold formal Methodists. You cold formal Baptists. You unbeliever. That's trying to beat Christ. How the nation try to put education and science in the sin of the Holy Ghost? You'll beat your brains out, and the light will still be on. He'll have a church that's filled with the Holy Ghost, and he'll come far and he'll live and reign in it. You'll never beat it out. You're just beating your brains out, studying all kinds of man-made books and dogmas. Take God's Word and read it and say it's a truth and accept it. Sure. He that believeth in me, St. John 14, said, but he that believeth in me, the works that I do, maybe he shall do the same. That would be so uncertain, wouldn't it? But he shall do! <laughs> He shall do the same works that I do. And more than this, because I go to my Father. Nothing uncertain about it. It's positive. You say, but Brother Bram, I've, I've joined all the churches. <laughs> On the day of Pentecost, as I said last night about Dr. Simon Peter, Peter said, Repent, every one of you. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Not you, maybe you will. Perhaps you will. But you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises into this generation, and that's all. Oh, no. Unto you and to your children. And to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. Not maybe, but as many as the Lord God called, you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Yes. Yes. I'm troubled. You want to shake hands and sprinkle instead of repent and be baptized. Repent and turn around. Amen. Leave your unbelief behind. Start up the little believing God. There's Calvary. Amen. Turn around. Yes. Start up the road. And you will receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You shall receive it. Is that right, brother? Amen. I did not just quote that scripture, did I? Oh, I put it just the way it's wrote. Amen. You Amen. shall receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. You shall. Not maybe, perhaps you would, you ought to, but you shall receive it. Well, the promise is unto you and to your children, and to them that's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's certain. I don't just walk up and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Hold my head over in a salt shake, pour a few drops of water on me. I go back and say, I'm a full-fledged member now. i got the right hand of fellowship. You'll never get the Holy Ghost. You ain't got nothing. A lot of confusion. That's right. Lick out your tongue. Take a little wafer. Some man made in the priest drinks the wine. Say, I took the Holy Communion. <laughs> the Holy Eucharist, which means the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost didn't come with a wafer. It come like a sound from heaven. Like a wafer from heaven. Amen. See, that's uncertain. I can't read that in the Bible. But when I hear it come from heaven like a rushing mighty wind, that's it. That's it. Jesus said, wait up there to Jerusalem now. Don't you start preaching. Don't you. I don't care how much experience you got and how many seminaries you went through and how far you're graduated. You wait up there until. Amen. Until what? Till we get our Bachelor of Art degree? No, sir. 
Wait until two days until you're endued with power from on high. Amen. And then and not before will you be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Bloomington, Illinois. Well, glory. Hallelujah. Anyway, the utmost parts of the earth. That's the gospel. And so they said, now we'll go up and see if the bishop comes up. That's what we do today. Or we'll find out the priest gives us, confirms us. That was uncertain sound. I don't know nothing about that. I'm like David, take a little armor off of me. Well, if you go to school and learn, I don't know nothing about that either. Yeah, I don't know nothing about that. The Bible won't speak anything about that. I never see anything in the Bible about that. Well, now listen, if you will confess with your lips that Jesus is the Christ and take him, you have received the Holy Ghost. Because the minute that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you have the Holy Ghost. That's an uncertain sound. Yeah, that's true. That's right. Paul said, after you see the people even saved and shouting and jumping up and down, he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Acts 19, 5. Oh, yes, he did. Amen. And he said, if an angel from heaven, let alone a preacher, if an angel from heaven preached any other gospel to you than this which I've already preached, let him be accursed. There's no uncertain sound about that. That's the Bible. Certainly. And when they were all up there in one place in one accord, and suddenly there came not an uncertain sound, no, but a certain sound came. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Cloven tongues set upon them to fulfill Isaiah 28, 19's prophecy. That the Holy Ghost set upon them and they all begin to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Just a moment. Hebrews 13, 8 said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, day, and forever. And he's partially the same yesterday and forever. He is the same. No uncertainty about that. In closing, I might say this. I'll keep you too long, I know I do. But oh, you poor sleepy head that has to get out. And when I used to pray all night long, so I don't know. I, please don't think I'm hurting you. I'm just following what he says. Tell me, because I don't know what to say. I got gumption enough to say it, but I just got gumption enough to say what he says. Say it. It's up to you. Look, how many of you ever heard of Paul Rayner? He wrote this famous song. Only believe. Paul was a wonderful brother. I knew him. He used to be a woodsman. He used to chop wood. And he said one time when he was in missionary fields, he fell sick. I believe he had black water fever or something. He and his wife was down in the islands, and they way away from doctors and everything. And Paul, anybody know Paul, know he's a believer in divine healing. So then I'll be preaching around his tabernacle week after next. By the way, I'm going to be preaching next, week after next in the suburbs of... Uh, of uh, Bloomington, the suburbs, Chicago, see, of Bloomington. So you come on over, see. And so then, um, remember, don't tell the Chicago people that. I don't know whether they stand for that or not, but anyhow, I'll be over there, the Lord willing. And then Paul Rader, he said he got real sick, kept getting sicker, 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 and it got a dark room. He said, why? Come close. He said, honey, I may be going now. He said, stand by my bedside, pray for me. He kept getting darker and darker. He kept confessing, God, you're my healer. Darker and darker, 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 darker. He kept on going. After a while, he passed completely out. And he dreamed. He said he thought he was back. He'd come from Oregon, you know. He said he thought he was back there chopping wood. And his boss in the logwood said, Paul, go up and fell a certain 18-inch tree or 14-inch tree or something like that. Bring it down yourself. All right. But up the hill he went, smelling them wonderful pine needles and just having a glorious time. Said he tucked me into his feet, that old double bit of the axe that she sunk into that soft timber, you know. Farther north you go, colder it gets, softer the timber. Hotter it gets, well, harder the timber, the same material. So then, said he fell the tree, trimmed it up right quick. Said he stuck his axe down in it. Said, my, he picked that tree up. You know, Paul was a strong man, weighed better, well, weighed over 200 pounds. So he reached down, put his knees together, and a man's muscles was in his back and his legs and so forth. So he reached down so he could pick it up. And when he got a hold of it, he pulled and he pulled and he pulled and he just couldn't get it up. He stuck and he said, I've lost my strength. I just can't get that log up. Well, I packed him twice that time. And he tried again and he wrestled and he wrestled and he wrestled until he just wore out. See, that that fever. Said he got so depleted till he just sat down against the tree and said, I just can't go no farther. 
I'm just gone. I can't go no further. And said directly he heard his voice, his boss, his boss, his voice. Paul? He said, yes, boss. Does that sound awful sweet? So what you tussling with it for? So he turned around. He said it wasn't his boss. His real boss. Yeah. He said, Paul, you're just wrestling with it and wrestling with it and wrestling with it. He said, you see that stream of water leading right there? He said, yes. He said, that stream of water comes right down to the camp. He said, why don't you just throw it in the river, jump on it, and ride on down to the camp? Oh, he said, I never thought of that. Then he just pushed it over the water and jumped on it. Said, over the river as he went, just having a big time splash water. Said, I'm riding on it. I'm riding on it. And when he come to himself, he stand right in the middle of the floor, screaming top of his voice, absolutely he'll say, I'm riding on it. I'm riding on it. I'm riding on it. <laughs> Bible said Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm riding on it. The Holy Ghost is for whosoever will. I'm riding on it. I believe that Jesus Christ is alive from the dead. We're living in the last days. And Jesus said, The works that I do shall he do also that believes on me. Amen. And promise in this last days that the Messiah time will return to the church. Amen. Theologians different if you want to, and I'll point you to thus saith the Lord night after night have done it. Yes. What about it? I'm riding on it. Oh, God's word. Amen. Amen. I feel like shouting. Amen. I'm riding on it. God's word. I believe it's for whosoever will let him come. I believe he's right here now. I believe it. I never. I can't. Those words. If you disagree with them, they're from God. I'm riding on it. I've rode for 31 years on it. And as long as the Lord lets me live and keeps my life mine and by His grace, I'll ride on it till I come to the river of Jordan. I'll throw it in and ride on it all the way across the river. See that God sees and heaven and earth will pass away with His word. Amen. Amen. I'm a ride on it. I believe that's the Holy Ghost that's in here now. I believe that's the Jesus Christ. I believe that's the same one that, that appeared to them that night like the speaking in tongues said tonight, or the interpretation. When they were shut in, he showed himself alive. Said, I don't believe he'd get out of the prayer cards. I believe one time this week, I believe he said. I doubt whether there's any here or not. Now, they don't even have to be. We don't need no prayer cards. A prayer card's just a number to get you on the platform. You don't have to get on the platform to find Christ. He's where you will be. Right out there where you are now. I challenge you to take God's word and write it. Believe it? How many doesn't have prayer cards? Raise up your hand. You're sick. Well, I guess it's general everywhere. Heavenly Father, oh, my rude way, Lord, I, I didn't get a chance to speak to, like ministers speak in this last day has gone. I don't know why you didn't let me have it, but I wish I could make what I have in my heart, just to speak it in such a way that they'd understand it. Please, Lord, let me, by the mercies of God in my heart, prove to them that the thing that I'm trying to tell them is the truth, anyhow. I pray that you'll do it once more. I'm, I ask you to do it, Lord. That the people might know that if you said so, it's the truth, God. It's got to be the truth. And it's no uncertain sound. If you raised up again, you said that your church would see you, you'd be with them, and do the, the church would do the same thing you did, and you'd be with them always, even to the end of the world. God, I'm standing on that. You proved it. You said you was, and I know you're here tonight. And God, forgive my hysterical, emotional, nervous disposition. And I pray, Father, that you'll forgive us our sins and our unbeliefs, and that you'll settle us under the power of the Holy Ghost. 
may men and women, somebody in here tonight, Lord, have enough faith to call you down from glory. And may their sickness and things be in such a way, whether it's great or whether it's not. You're God. You know all things. You healed a man with a, some kind of a retarded disease and left hundreds sat there twisted, lame, and blind. And then you come around and didn't heal the twisted, lame, and blind. You're just God. You do what you want to do. I'm your servant, Lord. And these are your servants sitting here. That it might encourage the church. Let it be known tonight, Lord. Let's, we're going to shut the doors of, of all unbelief and take you into our heart like Theopius and them who come from Emmaus. You've talked to many of these people, these good Methodists, Baptists, Catholics, Presbyterians, Pentecostals. Maybe they didn't recognize it was you. Then, Father, I pray tonight that you'll do something just the way you did there. Just the things that you did uh, before you were crucified so that they'll know that you are the risen Lord. That you're not dead, you're here. You're alive. They've heard it so much, Lord, till it just becomes common to them. But I pray, God, that tonight it'll be afresh to them to let them know that this living Jesus that's soon coming is here in our midst. Won't you do it, Father? I ask it for God's glory and for the edifying of thy church. In Jesus' name, amen. Look on me as his servant. Believe with all your heart, you sick people. Don't you have one doubt in your mind? But you believe with all your heart and see if he remains, if Jesus Christ lives. I solemnly hold my hands before God. As the only people that I know that I could identify in this building, and I wouldn't say to them, is my friend here, uh, Brother Gene Gore and Brother Stagg from Chicago. Uh, worked with Winchester Company as a sporting place, personal friend of mine. Well, I'm not sure these two little women in the tree sit not only their friends of mine from Chicago. These two little girls sitting there, a little redhead, a little blackhead up. I'm not sure that's Brother Welsh and his daughters. Is that right? Outside of that, yes. Here's one of the Christian businessmen from Chicago. I can't think your name, your son is the secretary. Right there. I can't call your name. Yes, you're two together. I don't know what you said. Preaching this anointing. It's here. I feel it. I know it just blinds you almost, you see, so you're not yourself. Outside of that, I don't know anyone. <coughs> no person. You have faith in God. You believe. Say, Lord Jesus, I know the Bible says that you are a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. And I know that you're still that high priest. Do you say amen? Then if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, do you believe that? Amen. Are you willing to ride your soul on that from here to the present? That he's the same yesterday, day, and forever? Amen. Then if he is the same, how would he act the same as it is then? Is that right? Amen. Does the Bible say that Jesus is the Word of God? Do we believe that? Amen. And the Bible says that the Word of God is a discerner of the thoughts of the heart? Is that right? And you pray. Let us shout. Now! To you that's in doubt. If you want to come here to this microphone, you critic, and you want to take this microphone and do the same thing, it's yours. Come take my place. <coughs> and if you can't, then you still forever. Bishop, Dean, Doctor, whoever you are, come to us. Then believe on Jesus Christ. Pray, you Christians. You say you pray, Brother Brown, I'm certain. I'm sure that that angel who spoke to me that night told me the Word of God. I'm not afraid. 
He'll do it. He promised it. Now, I can't hear you. Anyone thinks that you're, 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 you're not even, you, you're, you're think, you get that in your head, you, you'll never be called. You get your head that Jesus Christ has already done it for you. Then have faith. I'm just waiting. I, I can't. If he don't tell me, I can't say a thing. Brother, would you on that piano only believe this moment for him? I've been preaching so hard. Just quiet. Let's imagine him. Come walking down. Say, Lord, I'm very sick. Will you have mercy on me? I can't. If you believe me. Or all things are possible to them to believe. I've just been told that your word says such and such a thing. That you would be in your church and make yourself known, just as you did. I've heard him tell it all week long. I, the man's bound to be telling the truth because he go right home and read it out of the Bible. It's a problem. Maybe I wasn't thought that. But I know it's the truth. I believe you. I believe you, Lord. Help thou my unbelief. Now there, there. In the name of Jesus Christ, I take every spirit under you in here under my control. Here, raise your head. The little gray headed lady is sitting there. I'm a striker, there's a little lady right here. There's a lady, I'm sorry. I'm here for you. Hang over here. Can't you see that light? Look here. The emerald light, like you see the picture. There it is, right over the lady. It's moving around. Forgive me if I ask you that. This is another dimension. I realize I'm in an auditorium. And I realize I'm looking at a woman. And she's praying. And I'm watching her. I never seen her in my life. But I can if I were to tell you by the Holy Spirit what you're praying about, you'll know whether it's the truth or not. You're praying about a rupture. That is right. Also an intestinal trouble. Complication. If that is right, raise up your hand like this. If I'm a stranger, you raise your other hand up. There's a certain sign of his resurrection. She touched something. Is that right? How about you all? You believe? Sitting here with his head bowed, crying, praying, sitting here on the steps. You got stomach trouble, haven't you, sir? You're a stranger with him. You stay a little while. You got to go back home. You're from the morning. That's right. Your wife has a gland trouble, doesn't she? Your little boy, little child, got asthmatic condition. That's right, raise up your hand. Put your hand over all both of them. Believe and go home and be well. You 
Jesus. You don't have no such a thing as a prayer card, do you, sir? No. You just believe it. Is that right? We're strangers one another. Raise up your hand. You, you and I don't know one another. We're strangers one another. Have faith. Something happened, I'm not too sure where it was. Bleeding, red. It's a man. Raise your head right in here. <clears throat> You're suffering with a gallbladder trouble. You were praying, oh God, let it be me tonight. Right, sir. Are we strangers to one another? Raise up your hand if we're strangers to one another. Can't you? I know you can't do that lie of us. You're not from right here. You're from a city called Canton. Right. Your name is Mr. Ellis. That's true, isn't it? Raise up your hand. Right. Here's a lady down just below you, sitting down this way, hands up to her mouth, praying. She has a stomach trouble. You have a bronchial condition in your throat, too. We're strangers to one another. Say, you're also from Canton. That's the exact right. Your name is Miss Ethan. E-F-F-L-A-N-E. That's right, raise up your hand. Or stand up on your feet so the people can see if that's the truth. Now, if we're strangers, raise up your hand. You believe me? Then I send you home to be well. In the name of Jesus. I'm right on it. It can't fail. If Jesus Christ, the Son of God, raised from the dead, doing the same thing the Holy Spirit interpreted to the man tonight and said, like it was coming from Emmaus, to shut him with God. Do you believe it with all your heart? Now, while it's getting blind to me, how many sinners and you're every one of these? Come here and stand by me, Mr. You want to ride into glory on his word? Come here and stand here, Another. Come on out of the balcony. Rise up. All sinners come here just a minute. Young and old. That's the way to come. Come right ahead. It's all right. Baby. Such conviction, man falling over one another. Come. Come. Why are you trusting anything that's uncertain some church theologies? Come be born to the Holy Ghost or you're lost. Your church will never save you, as good as it may be. If you only belong to church, you're lost until you're born again. Come! God gave the word as a certain sound. He confirms it with a certain sound. And it's perfectly in order. Come! Every soul of sin of rest, come. Trust in the Lord. I invite you to come. No uncertainty about this. God said so. God confirms the word. And you're hearing for some of the last times because I'm leading the country. And there'll never be another on the field till I'm gone. Thus saith the Lord. There has not been and will not be. Come on, you can. Remember, I'll meet you at the judgment. You say you ought to sing some pathetic song. You ought to get up out of your seat and come on the conviction out of the pathetic song. But the Word of God and the witness of the Holy Ghost. Flee the wrath of God to come. Flee the scorches of hell that they sit in. Come when you've got a chance to come. Remember. I say in the name of Jesus Christ, I will not be responsible for your sins 
at the day of judgment if you don't come right back and receive Christ. You that has not got the Holy Ghost, you that don't know that you're a real Christian, you come, I challenge you, I call you, I persuade you in the name of Jesus Christ. You think it's too far from the balcony? It'll be a longer distance than that when you walk that road to the eternal hell. Where you'll start sometime for eternity. Oh, Lord, the rest is yours. I can't do no more. growing late. God's patience is growing thin. This may be the last time you'll ever have a call at your heart. You better come. You might cry for that call some night when you're laying out there on the highway, blood running out of your veins, pinned under your car, laying there in the bed and the doctor saying you're gone. You might want that feeling come to your heart. It'll not be there. He'll laugh at you. You better come now. Remember, I tell you in the name of the Lord. You be I ain't called myself his prophet. You did. I know the word of the Lord that is true. He's confirmed it. Come ever so. Come, that's right. Come, come now while you can come. Flee the wrath that's coming. The following is.
everywhere. Methodist, you pray the way you do in your Methodist church. Baptist, you do the same. Presbyterian, you do the same. Pentecostals, you do the same. You hear us on your knees. I give you to Jesus Christ as the trophies of His work. I give you to Jesus through the people tonight as a trophy of your message, of your Holy Spirit, the certain sound that comes forth that proves that you are not dead, but you are a living Christ, that lives in your church, that lives in your people, that gives to them the Holy Spirit and life eternal to all who will come, regardless of their affiliation, their system that they might belong to. You are God. You change not. You prove yourself to be God. You know the heart of every man. You know the name of every man. You know the place of the calling. You know everything, God, because you're omnipresent, omnipotent, infinite God. I pray that you save them Lord, of your grace. Fill them with the Holy Ghost. Send the Spirit of God upon the poor audience, Lord. And just let every heart be saturated. May the believers now give them morning with the Holy Ghost that they might be thankful to God that they are saved in these days. Grant it, Lord, that every one that sinneth has. I'm tired now, I'm really. Will you take the service? God bless you. There you go. All right, man. Let all the ministers come. We're going to have the Holy Ghost. Get down the mountain, man. Get down the mountain. Right now. Right now. This is the hour. Amen. I want to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the 30th feet. Stand to your feet to receive the Holy Ghost, everyone.